Good afternoon. Uh, I should say in the beginning that we are spaced six feet apart, which is why we're not wearing masks, <laughs> so that's out of the way now. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Faith and Flourishing, welcome to what promises to be a thoughtful and enriching conversation on Christian political and cultural engagement. My name is Daniel Bennett. I'm an associate professor of political science and assistant director at the Center for Faith and Flourishing. And I'm honored to be moderating today's conversation between Justin Gibney and Andrew Walker. Um, before we begin, please uh, join me as we pray. Almighty God, thank you for your goodness. We are grateful for the opportunity we have to meet together today for this discussion. Thank you for providing this forum and for the safe travel for our speakers. May their words of this afternoon reflect your heart for the world, as well as the diversity of your body in the church. God, we continue to pray for those who are hurting in our nation as a result of this pandemic, the evil we wit recently witnessed in Atlanta, and so many trials unspoken and unknown to us here. Thank you for giving comfort to those who need comfort, encouragement, encouragement to those who need encouragement, and peace to those who need peace. Thank you, God, for your mercy and your unfailing love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. For decades, the United States has been in the midst of deepening political and social polarization. Academic research and casual observation has shown that people are increasingly sorting into not only political camps, but also those based on religion, culture, education, race, the list goes on. Well, this kind of sorting pretends real problems for the American political experiment in the future, Christians should be especially concerned. As society continues to polarize and divide, our congregations on Sundays and our communities throughout the rest of the week have the potential to become more and more homogenous and less and less reflective of the diversity that exists in the kingdom of God. Polarization of this kind is not just a political problem or a cultural problem, it is a problem for the church at a time when she must dwell in unity. Thankfully, there's been no shortage of efforts uh, within the church and broader Christian community to respond to these challenges. Our two guests this afternoon have been on the forefront of these conversations for years, and though they bring different perspectives with them about the ideal approach for Christians to take in their political engagement, as someone who has been following their work for a long time, I am comfortable saying that their goals are not connected to winning or beating the other side but rather to promote an environment where the common good is strengthened and people are able to authentically flourish. Given the center's mission, I can think of no better conversation than the one we're about to have today. So after I introduce both speakers, we'll turn the mic to each of them for their initial comments on our theme this afternoon. Then we'll have a time for discussion, followed up by questions from you in the audience, here in person, and watching online. Enter that code on the Slido app to find our event, and uh, you can ask your questions there. And just as a reminder, you can keep tabs on all of the Center's upcoming events and opportunities by visiting faithandflourishing.org. So now we'll introduce our speakers. Justin Gibney is an attorney and political strategist in Atlanta, Georgia. He is a co-founder and president of the AND Campaign, a Christian civic organization, and he is the co-author of Compassion and Conviction, the AND Campaign's Guide to Faithful Civic Engagement. He served as the co-chair of Obama for America's Gen 44 Atlanta Initiative, and in 2012 and 2016, Georgia's 5th Congressional District elected him as a delegate for the Democratic National Convention. He, also served, he has also served on the Urban League of Greater, uh, of Greater Atlanta Board of Directors and has written op-eds for publications such as Christianity Today and The Hill. Andrew Walker is Associate Professor of Christian Ethics and an Associate Dean at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he also serves as the director of the Carl F.H. Henry Institute for Evangelical Engagement. Prior to his current position, he served as Senior Fellow in Christian Ethics at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, he is the co-author of Marriage Is, How Marriage Transforms Society and Cultivates Human Flourishing, and is the co-author of the First Freedom Religious Liberty Small Group Curriculum. He authored the award-winning book, God and the Transgender Debate, What Does the Bible Actually Say About Gendered Identity, and is the author of the forthcoming book, Liberty for All, Defending Everyone's Religious Freedom in a Pluralistic Age. Please join me in welcoming both of our speakers this afternoon.
to kick things off, we're going to turn first to Justin. Well, good evening. Uh, I am honored to be here uh, today to have the opportunity to speak to you all. It's actually good to be doing an in-person uh, mm. event. I've been talking to computers for too long, so uh, <laughs> feel free to give me feedback. Even a boo might even feel good by, at this time. Uh, but, but glad to be here. You know, my, as you know and you heard, my ministry focuses on the intersection between faith and politics. And so I kind of have the peculiar commission of emphasizing the importance of politics as a way of loving our neighbors and promoting human flourishing and protecting human dignity, while at the same time de-emphasizing politics to the believer who might be treating it as an ultimate thing. To say that politics is very important, but it's not all important. To say that we should be engaged in a passionate and determined way, but we can't allow our identity to be too closely connected to our party or our ideological tribe. And this is really a question that Christians need to focus in on in a serious way. What does it mean to be a Christian? There's this tension here, right? What does it mean to be a Christian who loves their neighbor and will sacrifice and advocate for their neighbor, but not treat it as if it's the ultimate win of the Christian life? To always remember that the Great Commission always has to be ahead of whatever we're doing politically to make sure that we never allow politics or social action, or well, maybe the better way to put it is to make sure that, we, that the gospel never seems like it's just a means of achieving political or social ends. This is the tension or one of the tensions that I think Christians really have to deal with in a better way and that we need a, a, a better uh, uh, articulated theology sometimes when it comes to applying our values to the issues of the day. So these are some of the things that we look at. What does it mean to be a Christian in this space, to be serious about it, but to keep things in perspective? To engage in politics, but make sure that the Christian life is ordered in a way that politics isn't putting you in a position where you're being unfaithful. To make sure that we're not giving Caesar what belongs to God. I think too often we have done that. I'll I'll tell you just a little bit about my story and how it leads into what the AND campaign's about and how we see Christianity and, 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 um, and politics kind of intersecting. Um, once I graduated from uh, law school, moved down to Atlanta, eventually probably within two or three years, may, maybe three years, got engaged in politics. And I'll be honest with you, I got engaged in politics probably for the wrong reasons. Uh, I read a lot of political bi- biographies. I'm very interested in politics. But I think one of the main reasons that I did it was because I was still c- kind of like, maybe even grieving from not being able to play football anymore. And so I was actually, it's true, I was actually looking for something to fill that void because it had, it, it kind, it had become kind of a, an idol in my life. And I was looking for the competition. And some way I, I, I kind of looked and I was like, I was looking at these campaigns, I was like, this is a way to be involved in competition. And so I literally entered into politics because of the competition, because of the kind of the intrigue and all the things that went into it. I wouldn't recommend that being the reason you get into it, but it, but it was for me. And, and God uses different things to get us where he needs us to be, but that was kind of my motivation. And when I first got into politics, I was working on campaigns, a mayoral campaign, and I had the attitude, I had read a couple um, political books about great uh, p- political managers and strategists, and they're always kind of cutthroat. They were always the guys who were willing to do whatever they had to do to get the job done. And so I sort of modeled myself that way. I mean, this was even before trolling was a thing. But we used to, I mean, all kinds of stuff. We used to get on um, comment sections and just tear down the other candidate using, you know, anonymously, which to me is, is cowardice, right? We used to get on those boards and just say whatever we thought voters might react to. And that's how I conducted myself because I understood that people wanted to work with the guy who was going to do whatever they needed to do to get the job done. They weren't going to ask any questions, just get the job done, and that's who they wanted. And that's who I became for a time. But then one of the mayoral candidates that I went against years later, uh, I saw her and I, and I said, you know, hey, how's it going? And she, and she looked at me and it was a really sad face and she said, well, I'm good now that you guys are off my back. <laughs> And at that moment, I kind of realized, I looked at myself and I said, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. Like this, this woman had a life. She, you know, whatever I was saying anonymously, because I, I didn't want people to know who I was, it was affecting her life and her well-being. 
And I had to decide that's not who I wanted to be. Uh, during that same time while I was running campaigns and doing things like that, I, I also realized that a lot of my friends who wanted to run for office um, or, 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 you know, or, were, or people who I was managing their campaigns, they felt like they needed to leave some of their biblical values uh, out of their politics. Uh, I was in a very progressive space so that they knew they couldn't talk about the Christian sexual ethic, they couldn't talk about sanctity of life, and it was an assumption. It was like, if I want to run, I know I'm going to have to let that go. And that never sat right with me. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, this was during kind of the, the Tea Party era, and so I had friends on the Republican side and Republican spaces that didn't feel like they could be as uh, compassionate as they wanted to be. There was a harshness there. Um, and I started, God sort of started to reveal to me this false dichotomy in our politics. And the idea was that if you wanted to be in politics, you'd have to go to the left or you have to go to the right. If you went to the left, it's because you cared about justice and you were willing to let go of any of those Christian convictions that aren't <laughs> cool with popular culture, right? If you go to the right, it's because you care about moral order and you're willing not to be so focused on some of that compassion uh, that, that I, I think the Bible talks so, so much about. And so you had to make this choice. It's like you're choosing between justice or you're choosing between moral order. You're choosing between your compassion or your convictions. And I just thought that was a false dilemma because when I look in the gospel and I see how Jesus interacted with people, it wasn't one or the other. He didn't choose love or truth. He chose both of them. And that became clear to me as I read through Ephesians 4 one day. And in Ephesians 4.15, Paul says, basically, you know, Ephesians, the church of Ephesus had people trying to infiltrate the church with false doctrine. They had all this stuff going on in this persevering church. And he says, with, with everything that's going on, you should always be able to speak the truth in love. And it really opened up to me that that was the gospel. It was the truth and love. It wasn't just one or the other. Right. Because we would know that if it was just love, love is form. You know, it wouldn't have any form. It'd be love that was whatever we made it out to be. But if it was just truth, it would be harsh. It would be uncompassionate. And that it wasn't only in our personal interactions that we needed to have this love and truth kind of uh, connection, but even in our public witness. And then I started to look at how maybe to different extents, each side of the political conversation or the political spectrum was missing some of the things uh, that I think Christian life demanded that we have, right? So me being in a progressive space, if I just went along with whatever the progressives did, I was leaving behind the truth in some areas. And we're never helping people if we're not willing to tell them the truth. But if we go all the way to the right and we're so focused on moral order and law and order, but there's no justice and there's no love and there's no compassion, then we're missing something. And I really began to see that a lot of Christians had allowed their political affiliation to become religious in nature, mm. that we had separated our politics from our values, even if we didn't admit it, and we had conflated sometimes our ideology with our theology. And we had to remember that conservative uh, ideology and conservative uh, theology are not always the same. They're not always gonna come to the same conclusions. Uh, a biblical understanding of justice is not going to be the same justice that we're going to get from a secular society. So it was really time for Christians to step away from some of this indoctrination and really start thinking through in a more critical way, what were we representing? It was time for Christians to get away from this kind of addiction to power and to really make sure that our witness was louder and more important than actually winning. Now, we all want to win. I, I said earlier today, I'm a political strategist. I do not strategize to lose. We want to win. <laughs> but win in conflict. As we're all here as Christians today, win in conflict. Are we willing to choose our witness over the win? Are we willing to lose to make sure that we put the right witness into the public square? And too many times, and I think we've seen this recently, too many times Christians have chosen to win over having the right witness. And to me, I think that's just misplaced faith. Are we putting our faith in an election? Are we putting our faith in a policy outcome? Or is there something bigger that's ultimate that we really lean on? And what does it say to other people when we're willing to lose to make sure that we maintain our principles? That we're not willing to revise our principles on each election to make sure that it fits what we want to do at that time? 
that we're willing to stand by what we believe, even if it means we lose three election cycles in a row. Again, nobody wants to do that, but it's a matter of faith if we're willing to do that in a situation where these are very serious issues. And so I think Christians had to, I started to think that Christians had to come to a place where we were able to say what our principles were and we would be able to come together because the truth of the matter is, a lot of what's the, what divides us is ideology. A lot of what divides us is, is partisanship. It's not Christian principles. We have an agreement on Christian principles, but what we don't understand sometimes is in the, in the political, political um, space, there are, there are people that don't want African-American Christians who may have more uh, culturally conservative values but be Democrats or white evangelicals who may be Republicans. There's a lot of people who don't want us to come together to have a conversation. They want to be able to interpret what the other is saying for us, so that we don't have those conversations together. And so what the Ann campaign is trying to tell people is if we focus on Christian principles and put the ideology and the partisanship aside, you can still be in a party, but we can't outsource our beliefs to a party and we can't allow our social action to be, to be mastered or to be controlled by an ideology or a party. And so that's the message that we've been trying to get through to Christians. We've been trying to raise civic literacy so Christians actually understand the process, that they understand exactly how they can be effective in the public square, but also they understand how to apply their values to the issues of the day, which in many cases means reframing the issue. So many issues today I think Christians get wrong because we've been asked the wrong question. Now, as an attorney, I know that I can ask you guys a question where there's two wrong answers. And sometimes that's what society does to us. Do you affirm this person's behavior or do you hate them? That's, a false, that's, a, that's, that's two wrong answers, right? I have to reframe that question and say, no, I, I love them and I disagree with that. But I also see their human dignity. And unless we have the ability to reframe a lot of these questions, we're going to be missing each other, not because we have different principles, but because we haven't questioned the premise of the question or reframed the question. Uh, and so that's a lot of what the AND campaign is trying to do. We believe that Christians can come together and we think that there's a value and a benefit to the fact that there's Christians on both sides of the aisle. That means if we actually came together and focused on certain issues that were based on biblical principles, we could really change a lot of what's going on in society if we were willing to look past partisanship and really look to biblical principles and, and here's the big one, be willing to challenge our side of the conversation. Amen. Not be so tied to our party or our ideology that every time somebody insults your party or your ideology, you think it's an insult to you. Well, if that's the case, then you're identity is in your party. Your identity is in your ideological tribe. Because you can come up to me and say anything about the the Democratic Party. It could be an insult. It could be a critique. It's not going to offend me. I might actually agree with you because that's not part of my identity. I'm as willing to critique my side as I'm willing to to critique the other side. And until Christians have that separation between themselves and their party and remove their identity from that conversation, we'll never be able to challenge our parties and our ideological tribes in the way that we need to. All right. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to move over to Andrew for his 15 minutes. Great. Thank you. I uh, prepared some remarks. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about religious liberty of late. And uh, I'm a Baptist. Baptists care about religious liberty. And I think actually a better understanding of religious liberty would help us understand a lot of the confusion that exists in society around how we think about issues of moral, religious, and ideological difference. And religious liberty, I think, is, is um, it's an article of peace for our society. And so I've prepared a, a brief talk called Embattled on All Sides, Does Religious Liberty Have a Future? So if you'll bear with me as I share this. Back in the 1990s, religious liberty was understood to possess a near bipartisan consensus on its importance in American society. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is now under assault and the latest uh, vision of the Equality Act was passed in 1993 with support from Democratic figureheads like Chuck Schumer and Ted Kennedy. And sadly, the idea today of prominent Democrats leading, lending their support for religious liberty um, on a measure uh, like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is simply unheard of 
and politically incalculable. And on the left, and don't worry, I'm going to critique the left and the right in this talk, that on the left, the consensus holds that religious liberty gives room to bigotry and poses the final obstacle to the untrammeled success of the sexual revolution. But a new challenge has also arisen among more traditionally conservative avenues. As American culture secularizes at breakneck pace, it is common to see figures on the right side of the spectrum question whether a laissez-faire approach to religion is not partly responsible for the fragmenting of American culture and the loss of its cultural consensus. As the argument goes, America is a country defined by its founding era's association with the Christian worldview. America did not arise out of a vacuum, and its uniqueness as far as its governing vision is a product of its Christian influence. And so the argument goes, if America ceases to be Christian, it ceases to be America. Now, there is an element of truth to this latter criticism. I do not believe that nations emerge out of vacuums. Ideas are enmeshed in cultural ecosystems, and if stretched beyond the bounds of its limits, America does run the risk of rejecting the constraints that made its propositional ideals at, at its founding possible to begin with. As the French philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville said, reflecting on America's religious landscape, he, he noted that despotism can do without faith, but freedom cannot. For de Tocqueville, religion, and what religion tends to foster by way of its impact on ethics, it fosters the conditions for true liberty defined as the ability to do what we ought. What I think de Tocqueville means is that mediating institutions, institutions like the family and the church and any voluntary association, are designed to act as meaning-giving buffers between an all-consuming libertarianism and an all-consuming state. What both libertarianism and statism have in common is that public order and the moral imagination become defined solely within the purview of humanistic ideals. When society insists that all that comprises it is either expressive individualism or government enacting its own utopic vision, liberty's loss is on the horizon. Societies need authorities that anchor their foundations beyond mere convention, raw majoritarianism, expressive individualism, and totalitarianism. That's where religion traditionally has fit it in, but a particular type of religion, one that does not see itself ushering in present-day utopias and which allow for error to persist within reason established by deliberate, deliberative governing bodies. Shorn of transcendence, religious-like impulse defined within the human horizon will always fill that void where religion is missing. The challenge of freedom is a balance in knowing how to use such freedoms nobly and virtuously without license or servitude eventually exploiting it. De Tocqueville similarly said this, he said, nothing is more wonderful than the art of being free, but nothing is harder to learn how to use than freedom. The inherent challenges of protecting an ecosystem of religious liberty mean that it was likely inevitable that stresses owing to the human condition, whether human autonomy or threats from the state, would eventually forge challenges to religious liberty posed to it by the left and the right. So let's talk about what those challenges are in particular. On the left, challengers are born not only of sexualized identity politics, but general uncomfortableness with what religion essentially is. A few years ago, there was a religious scholar named Reza Aslan who hosted a program on CNN looking at religion and spirituality. And the promo for the program included these words. Faith is mysterious, it's indescribable, and religion is just language you use to describe your faith. Although we're all speaking different languages, we're all saying pretty much the same thing. Religion is who you are, how you see yourself, your world. That's what it means to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim, I'm Jewish, I am Buddhist, I am Hindu. And he says this, these are far more statements of identity than they are statements of of faith. This is a deeply problematic way of looking at religion and gets at the heart of why some may be skeptical of religious liberty. Not only is it yet another example of subjugating the transcendent to the personal in the form of identity politics, but it also fundamentally miscommunicates the stark differences that religion and different religions lay hold of. 
If framed wrongly, religious liberty can easily be confused with a version of religious pluralism that is essentially relativistic. The idea that religion is really just a matter of preference among religious options that no one can say definitively is true. And if religious liberty is concerned with downplaying differences and treating claims of various religions as essentially equal, from this vantage point, it is certainly understandable why some would throw up caution about religious liberty. But on the right, a similar claim can be found, namely the idea that supporting the rights of other religions or basic viewpoint neutrality to have equal access in the public square is to allow and invite immorality and idolatry to roam free unchecked. Now, to be sure, not all viewpoints are equal, and I think there are legitimate ways to curtail such things as obscenity um, within our constitutional framework. But the contest we are waged in right now is to figure out how to protect the liberty we enjoy for ourselves without denying it to others. Or to use the famous quote from Leo Strauss, how to reconcile order, which is not oppression, with freedom, which is not license. But what of the charge that religious liberty simply gives space for idolatry to run rampant? Considering this is a rather new argument being heralded from unlikely conservative quarters, it is important to address this objection. And on the surface, it has its merits. After all, we're told to flee idolatry in the New Testament, and it seems to be that idolatry is incompatible with the New Testament's message of Jesus' lordship. So that raises the question, should Christians be defending the rights of other religious persons to persist in their sin and their idolatry? Does religious liberty mean that Christians want to see Islam, for example, have greater success and make even more converts? To answer this, we have to take a step back and ask why defending liberty in general is worthwhile. We defend liberty not to protect people's right to sin or to equivocate on the moral status of their sin, but to protect their ability to live in accordance with their grasp, with their individual grasp of truth. We are protecting and defending the faculty of the conscience, not what the conscience is directing a person toward, necessarily. Please let me be abundantly clear. This does not mean that what a person believes is necessarily correct or that all claims about the truth are necessarily true, but that the person making a sincere religious claim believes themselves to be comprehending a truth as best as they can grasp it by virtue of the cognitive faculties that we believe God gave them as image bearers. To protect the properly ordered use of a thing, we make allowances to a certain degree for the misuse of a thing. Imagine a society where every sin was criminalized. Criminalizing all sin or banning the misuse of a thing can engender the whole, uh, the whole architecture of liberty, uh, endanger the whole architecture of liberty, and engender an invasive, burdensome, and stifling political society. To protect Christianity... And civilizational order, should we really treat non-Christians as lesser citizens or stigmatize religious belief in hazardous ways, marginalizing them perhaps? Of course not. To think Christianity needs legal protections not afforded to other religions is to betray our confidence in the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation, not government. This speaks to a fundamental confusion surrounding religious liberty. To state it again, religious liberty is not concerned with defending the right to idolatry in and of itself. It is rather about defending the faculties that come to grasp religious truths. Moreover, no one argues that individuals have an ultimate theological right to idolatry before God. God does not respect idolatry, and in the fullness of time, as Christians, we believe that all idolatry will be judged. Rather, individuals have what we would say a penultimate political right to be uncoerced in their grasp and exercise of their religious faculties. To allow for people to come to a saving knowledge of faith in Christ authentically, society will have to leave room for people to believe erringly. Hmm. Religious liberty is not concerned with defending the merits of of different religion or equivocating on the differences whatsoever. Religious liberty simply recognizes one truth, that I cannot grasp religious claims for others. Because I cannot convert others by proxy, everyone has to come to their own settled conclusions on who God is, which means giving people space to make errors, to be mistaken. To protect the true exercise of liberty, 
We have to give space for others to believe wrongly, but ultimately in hopes that in this arena of liberty, where we give room for people to be wrong, it will give people a pathway to believe truthfully in time. We should not be fighting to defend the merits of anyone's idolatry, whether born of identity politics or false religion. I want everyone to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm fighting to defend a context where communication of Christian truths is not treated with hostility, but with goodwill difference. And so that people can come to grasp these truths for themselves and live honestly in accordance with the dictates of the gospel. In a society where I believe it is right and good to be treated equally under the law, to obtain that measure of freedom, we have to extend that same freedom to others. We may not like that other religions are given equal access to the public square, but the opposite reality would prove untenable as well, which is a society where all religions are treated with second-class contempt. Acknowledging the reality of stark and incompatible religious difference while possessing a shared legal status that allows for everyone to live faithfully with their conscience, even if in error, again, is not to defend the merits of another religion, nor is it actively willing the advance of another religion. It is accepting that for the gospel to go forward, it will have to do so without subsidy or assistance from the state. I'll begin concluding here. We have to understand that America need not be exhaustively Christian to be America, but neither can it be wholly secular either. To embrace this paradox means to defend the religious liberty of all faiths and to recognize that in a fallen social order, where massive religious difference is a simple fact of a fallen world, we have to understand, biblically speaking, that governing authorities have not been given the power of the sword over religious matters. The legitimacy of a common social order is not tied to the social order being united around the same religion. God has given us creational orders and the natural law to make society habitable. Scripture witnesses to the intelligibility of creation and reason as self-attesting witnesses to God's authority in the structure and design of the world, which necessarily includes the moral law. And when we run afoul of these moral laws, of course society will endanger itself. But the alternate reality, where we marginalize or coerce some and banish others, is not in keeping with the New Testament's pattern of statecraft or its view of soteriology. Of course, it would be desirable and ideal for all of society to be comprised of regenerate Christians, but that is not a reality we are told is possible apart from Christ bringing his kingdom in full. Religious liberty cannot fall victim to the modalities of hyper-individualism, relativism, or over-realized hegemony. Behind these are anthropological, epistemological, and eschatological errors of assumption that humanity is defined by desire, skepticism, and power. The allure of moral, religious, and cultural uniformity cannot come at the expense of religious freedom. A baseline of religious liberty is thus essential because unless all religions receive equal recognition under the law, one group will always set whatever exacting standards it desires as the basis of membership and participation in society whether Catholic versus Protestant, Protestant versus other Protestants, atheist versus evangelical, one group is always tempted to exclude based on some aspect of religious or viewpoint criteria. And one thing can be sure. Societies are inherently dynamic and majorities often changing. The challenge is to preserve a constitutional structure that assumes these dynamics and these changes and which perpetually retrieves their value in each age in order to secure the freedoms necessary for there to be freedom and liberty for all. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much Uh, to both of you for uh, for those perspectives. I wanted to come back to the Equality Act, given that's something that's uh, currently uh, moving in the United States Senate. There was a hearing the other day. It passed the House of Representatives by a fairly narrow margin, and President Biden has indicated that he would sign it if it came across his desk. Um, Justin and the AND campaign uh, organized a letter uh, supporting LGBT rights in some respects uh, while maintaining religious exemptions for certain groups such as this university, John Brown University. 
Um, this approach is captured by something like Fairness for All, which has been introduced in the House of Representatives, I believe. Um, so my question for Justin, and then I have a question for Andrew. Justin, how realistic is something like Fairness for All as an alternative to the Equality Act, considering the polarization and the incentives on both sides of the aisle? So that's for Justin. And then for Andrew, correct me now, you've spoken out against the Equality Act, and you've also opposed Fairness for All. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm wondering how you think Christians should be approaching these issues sure. legislatively. Sure. So first, Justin. So yeah, I think fairness for, well, number one, I think the Equality Act, it's, it's just unfortunate legislation. I think it's a product of a very broken system. Uh, it's a system of, of zero-sum thinking. It's a system where one side writes down everything they want and just pushes it through without really having any conversations. And if that's how we're going to move forward in our politics, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, for a bill that has such serious and significant impacts to have no consideration for faith communities mm -hmm. is a miscarriage of democracy if that passes through. So I want to be very clear on that. The AND campaign, we maintain the historic Christian sexual ethic, but we come into the conversation about the Fairness for All Act with historical context and with what we see as, as the compassion that the, the gospel demands, which is to say... We can't just think of our own interest in this conversation. The LGBTQ community, we can disagree with certain behaviors and uh, certain uh, ways of identifying, but we also have to deal with the history of the treatment of that group as well. Uh, we have to do some serious uh, self-examination and maybe even repentance on how we have treated um, people from that community. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to agree or affirm anything but it means we need to be honest about not carrying out what the gospel says we need to do for our neighbors. We think about kids being kicked out of their homes, people just not treated first with the compassion of Christ, but being treated just with condemnation. Us not seeing past someone's, the way somebody identifies to see their human dignity. And if we start off with that context, in my opinion, it's not enough for us to just create ironclad laws to protect Christians. If our politics are just about the politics of Christian self-interest and making sure that our laws are so tight that we could never have anything that could hurt us, I think we're missing something. I think we need to take a step and say, we've been wrong in the past, and I can't guarantee you you won't be discriminated against unless I try to put this in the law and show you through my policy and my, and my political uh, capital that I care about you. And I think the Fairness for All Act does this. For you, those of you that, do, that don't know, it comes from what they call the Utah Compromise. It's um, where Mormons and the LGBTQ community in Utah come together, and they actually find a way to coexist. So much of this debate assumes that LGBTQ rights and religious liberty are mutually exclusive, that they have to be in conflict. And I think that the Fairness for All Act shows that they don't necessarily have to be in conflict. That when you live in a pluralistic society, you can actually sit down with people and figure out ways for you both to thrive, for you both to be protected. But we have to be willing to have conversations and be willing to persuade and have a discourse with one another rather than just trying to compel one another to do what we want them to do. And, and that's really what the Equality Act is. But I think what Christians need to realize is the posture that we see coming from the Equality Act is the same posture that sometimes Christians had in the past that pushed this community to that point. I'm not saying it's all our fault, but in some ways it's a reflection of the ugliness in which they had been treated. And we need to ask ourselves, how do we reverse that instead of just continuing this back and forth? Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrew? Sure. Yeah, and I, I mean, so much of what Justin said is, is right on. Uh, I, yeah, I, so obviously I've spoken out and written against the Equality Act, and um, I don't support fairness for all. But let me say this. I know you guys have up, you're on record supporting it. Um, I, I appreciate so much the motive behind your support of it. And um, to me, my issue is not with the, the motive or the intention that we're all after, actually after, as far as the goal. Um, my concern with the Fairness for All Act, and I, I agree with all of Justin's statements, by the way, on the problems of the Equality Act, for sure. My problems with the Fairness for All Act is I think it leaves, it, it doesn't properly and narrowly tailor the protections and provisions that we actually see 
as some of the causes behind the conflicts happening in society today. So um, again, I don't think it's holistically bad legislation or proposal. I think it doesn't do enough because I think it trades uh, constitutional protections for statutory exemptions, um, but then also it leaves out certain industries um, unprotected. So, for example, it leaves um, the florist, the baker, the artist, for example, artistic industries unprotected. It leaves professional industries uh, where there's licensure involved unprotected. It leaves medical doctors unprotected. So if you have a medical doctor who does not want to prescribe hormone blockers, um, the Equality Act would force that person to um, be required to administer hormone blockers or hormone therapy and, or puberty, or, uh, puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and, so, and unfortunately, the, the Fairness for All Act would as well. Now, I think the Fairness for All Act is, is trying to do something good. It's trying to give both parties what they want. What I would suggest we do is more narrowly tailor those protections so that where there are particular vulnerabilities in American culture brought up in unique settings and contexts, all of those are enumerated and specified as far as what constitutes discrimination um, in each particular type of setting. So I just don't think, for example, um, a, a, a florist who's an evangelical Christian who uh, does not feel comfortable making a floral arrangement for a same-sex wedding, um, I don't think that's a, a form of a, a discrimination, how we would define it, like invidious discrimination. And I think that the Fairness for All, Fairness for All Act leaves individuals like that unprotected. So more legislative work might be needed. More, more legislative work. But I, we had this discussion yep. in your class. Yep. Um, the idea that social conservatives like myself are opposed to all forms of compromise is not true. I mean, the idea, um, the, the question we had posed in class was, um, do I support the idea of someone who is LGBT being denied a hamburger at a McDonald's? Absolutely not. Um, if we can craft legislation that is being very clear about these types of circumstances where sexual orientation as a discrete reality of personhood doesn't come into view, then I think that is uh, an entirely separate issue than when you're looking at, for example, creative expression type industries where artists are involved. Fair enough. Um, we have several questions I'd like to get to today, so we'll just, we'll just dive right, right in. Um, first, can the church, or maybe phrase a little bit differently, how do you both see the church's ability to uh, come together from both sides of the aisle? So, uh, you know, historically the black church has been more aligned with the Democratic Party, uh, white evangelicals certainly are more aligned with the Republican Party, but rather, uh, how can these two sides come together to seek racial reconciliation in the United States, and, and how should the church be approaching this particular topic? And whoever wants to start. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm always hopeful. Uh, as I as I said before, I think I think God is um, is always uh, working on His church and improving the church, and I think that we will get to play, to a place where we will see some racial renewal. But it's not going to be easy, and it's certainly not going to happen if we continue to romanticize American history. Look, I completely I completely agree with. There are some exceptional things about this country, and if, in our past, there's been some things that are sec exceptionally bad. Uh, the fact that we've had racism and discrimination written into our laws much longer than it's been out of the laws, right? I mean, if you're talking about Jim Crow, this is something that just ended in the 60s, right? There are people in here that were alive in the 60s, right? It's not that long ago. And so we need to deal not only with the history, but the lingering effects of that very serious history. How do we come together? I think it's by, one, having real conversations and walking into those conversations not with a... Uh, kind of this posture of self-defense. Hmm. I think too often when we talk about race, we go in it to that conversation very pridefully. Hmm. And we want to walk out of that conversation proving that we're faultless. So hmm. I, I don't care what happens hmm. in this conversation, you're not going to be able to blame me. Hmm. And that's how we go into that conversation. Hmm. And nothing can ever get done that way. It's prideful, and it's, a, it's not a biblical way to look at a serious subject. We have to really go in there, deal with the history of it, and deal with what's going on now and be willing to examine ourselves thoroughly in that regard. I always say that very few people went up to Jesus and walked away faultless and with mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. perfect narratives that we're always trying to defend. And I, I think where the rubber meets the road is just not the relationships. The relationship's important, the fellowship, fellowship is important. 
But at some point, we have to, number one, advocate together. So especially, I think, majority Christians have to come out of their comfort zone to advocate for things that would help their minority brothers and sisters that they haven't advocated for before, that maybe is outside of Republican orthodoxy. I also think that we have to um, be able to share resources in a way that is, that is gracious and charitable um, and showing that we really care without necessarily controlling the terms all the time. And I think from my point of view that we have to understand that God asks something, something of everyone, right? So while I think majority Christians have controlled that power dynamic, it hasn't been fair, I still have to be gracious. I still have to want to understand and have a level of patience to hear out what you have to say and to try to make it work. I can't move myself into identity idolatry and pretend that everything I do is okay when it's not. Uh, so we all, all have work to do and we all have to find a level of humility and empathy to really help this move forward, but we have to be able to advocate together, and we have to realize that there are people in the public square that do not want us to come together and have these conversations, and we have to be able to move them out the way to, to really have a, an honest conversation. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just be very brief on this. I mean, I, I think um, we, we have to be able to do exactly what Justin just did in terms of naming the context where things are going to make measurable improvement, which is in the form of relationships. Um, I also think we have to be extra attentive to the areas where there's a lot of heat, but very little light. I mean, I don't think social media and cable news is going to heal our country. We need relationships. I mean, I, I don't know Justin that well. Uh, we've known each other for probably five, known of each other for five or six years. Um, I want to get to know Justin better. And that can only happen in the context of relationships. And so, I mean, I just echo what he said. And to recognize that um, we, I mean, we, we need to, at the same time, while we're understanding the role of relationships, we've got to pay attention to public policy. We can look to issues like criminal justice reform that was passed in the last four years that I think um, is, a, is a positive, measurable goal that we can strive towards. Um, but we're not going to tweet our way to reconciliation. It's going to be done in the context of friendship. It's going to be done incarnationally. I think tweeting our way towards reconciliation, that seems like a fresh observation. Um, several questions in here uh, dealing with uh, juggling the, the tension in our Christian identity with the, uh, I guess, identity of our political party that, the parties that we affiliate with. Uh, one question, how do you suggest affirming Christian truth in the context of a political party if you believe that truth con conflicts with party ideology or orthodoxy? So how do, you, how do you balance those things? And I think another related question, this person says, I tend to vote against the other party instead of my own. Uh, should Christians double down on whatever party they happen to be in? Or, and I think Justin will have some stuff to say about this, but how do you work for transformation within a political party when you find yourself in the minority on some issues? I, I'll just say um, briefly on this. Um, parties are organic vehicles to achieve certain things, um, and parties can change over time. Um, so, I mean, I, I echoed every single thing Justin said a little bit ago about um, not finding your identity in a political party per se and its platform per se. Um, I am a Christian. I have um, theological convictions that inform my political convictions. And I have to understand that those convictions could manifest themselves in a number of different ways, irrespective of whether there's an R or a D in the policy formulation behind that. Um, so we just can't let ourselves getting sucked into the idea that um, republicanism is uh, Christian, nor being a Democrat is what it means to be Christian. To live in that uncomfortable tension, but to recognize at the same time as well that parties do have platforms, and those platforms do have serious repercussions on public policy. Um, and you know, one of the things Justin and I have been talking about today with other classes is um, not shying away from our differences. If you believe strongly about something, believe strongly about it, advocate for it. Justin wants to win. I want to win as well, sure. But do it in such a way that is done with integrity and honor and decency. 
Yeah, I would say in regard to the identity conversation, and I, I think uh, Andrew's right on what he was, um, on how he weighed in on that. When we talk about juggling your identity in the church and your identity in your party, there is no juggle. There's no balancing there. There's no, you know, there's not, these are not two equal weights. They shouldn't be two equal weights in your life, right? You are a Christian. You should know your Christian principles. You should stand on your Christian principles. And where they come into conflict with your party's ideology or your party's yep. platform, <clears throat> there's no equivocating on that, right? You need to be very clear that your party is wrong on those issues. And I think too often Christians compromise that. You know, we'll, we'll look away from certain truths because it would actually hurt us. Like, I get hit all the time for saying, you know, while during the camp, you know, some folks on the, on the right, left felt like while this campaign was going on, you couldn't say anything bad about the Democrats or else you're helping Trump win the, the election. Like, choose a side and just don't say anything about the other side. I'm like, that's the, that's the most ridiculous, most, I think, dumbed down form of politics I've ever heard. If something's wrong, a Christian has to testify and bear witness to the truth. If that truth hurts my party or hurts my, what my ideological tribe is trying to do, so be it. Because that's not really my tribe in the first place. Mm. And I think we really need to start seeing political parties as a tool. They do, very, those platforms have some very serious consequences, as Andrew was saying. Like, it's, it's nothing to play with. It's not, we're not saying that they're all created equal and it doesn't really matter which way you go. But we have to make sure that we're clear that we're Christians first and that we will question and push back and we have the courage to do so when necessary. And I think Christians really miss that a lot of times because, again, we're focused on winning. We're focused on making sure that we win this next election instead of saying whether we win or not, I have to do the right thing. Um, and we have to have faith, even if we can't see it, we have to have the moral imagination to say, me doing right and me saying what's right or wrong, even if it's not in my immediate benefit, is always for the greater good. It, it always is going to benefit in one way or another, even if it's just my public witness. That's what we're called to do. So we shouldn't think of it as a balance at all. Um, I think we should even question the idea of partisan loyalty. I've been a Democrat all my life, but what is partisan loyalty? Does it mean that when we have bad policy, I support my party anyway? Does it mean when we have bad behavior, I'm going to defend that behavior? If that's what your idea of partisan loyalty is, then that's wrong. And it's in conflict, it's in direct conflict with what the gospel demands of us. There's a few minutes left, so I think we can get a couple more questions in here. I like this question. What is something that both of you admire about how the other side, other political party is engaged in, in politics at the moment? I think... I do, while I do think that you know, conservatives do a better job when it comes to law and order also having justice in it, I do think when you look at cities like Portland that just don't understand human nature and that if people are, are acting badly, to give them more space to act badly is not going to end up well. Mm -hmm. And so I do appreciate to some extent how conservatives will say, no, 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 let's be more realistic about how this works. I do wish there was more justice in that conversation rather than just law and order. But I think there's an understanding that when people are acting poorly, now we may differ on exactly how you tamp down on it, but to say to give them more space to act poorly, it'll eventually go, go away, is just not realistic. And you know, ideas like defund the police, I think that while I have my disagreements with the, the, the right on that, they're right that the idea of defunding the police just is a missing, um, I think, an understanding of human nature and how um, how the, the interactions of when people are committing crimes and what folks are doing. So, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, it's, it's not that Republicans are not interested in issues of racial justice and racial reconciliation. It's that if Republicans are being honest and the conservatives are being honest, it's not a priority like it should be. And I think the right needs to hear from the left the priority that the left sometimes make it. The right may disagree with how the left does it, but um, I mean, I, I, this, this can only be stretched so far, but the, the old adage of, I like the way you do, or I like the way I do it better than the way you don't type of, type of mentality. And I think that um, the, the, the right needs to hear from the left in the left's focus on those types of issues. 
So another question here, maybe more practically speaking, what does it look like for people of faith to engage politics uh, beyond elections, beyond going to vote? So what are some other ways Christians can engage politics beyond every two or four years? I just think general, general advocacy. I mean, if you yeah. look at an issue like juvenile um, probation reform, in many states and in many localities, this is something that you can work on without even getting legislation. It's a matter of policy. It's a matter of discretion at a lot of levels. If Christians from both sides of the aisle were to come together and say, we're going to make sure that these juvenile justice policies, not that they let people get away with things and that you don't uh, correct them, but that they're actually doing what they're, they set out to do, then we could really change a system that could have kids going in the right direction uh, instead of just kind of flailing in a system that just isn't working. Uh, so, there's, so there's always way, things to advocate for. I think juvenile justice, juvenile probation reform in general is a good place to start. It's a bipartisan place, and we always need to be looking locally mm -hmm. to, to solve mm -hmm. things. And I think we can come together and do that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. Um, I think one of the problems of the age that we currently live in is we've had the nationalization of politics completely swallow up local politics. And um, I think that we, as Christians, tend to overlook the value of engaging with your local legislator, with your house member, with your state senator, not your U.S. senator, but your state senator, um, and the impact that individual lobbying and civil society or any voluntary association society can have on a state level. I actually do some contract work for the Kentucky Baptist Convention, um, and it's, there's really nothing fancy or special about it. You know what I do? I call their offices and say, I'm Andrew Walker. I'm calling on behalf of the Kentucky Baptist Convention. Could I talk to you about this issue that we care about? There's no rocket science to it. You don't have to be very impressive. Uh, if you get to know most legislators, they're actually not that impressive sometimes. <laughs> uh, they're very normal people. And so I would just simply say, get involved at the most local level. I mean, there's a theological principle in kind of Christian political theology um, called subsidiarity, which means you are to get engaged at those levels where you can have the most success and you can achieve the most things. And I really can't impact what's going to happen uh, on, on a vote in, in D.C. I can call my senator. I can vote one way or another when it comes time for a U.S. senatorial election. Um, but I really can get involved um, with some elbow grease at a local level, at a school board level. Um, po all politics is local. And I think we, um, in, in, in a social media age, in a cable news, day, a cable news age, the temptation is to forego what is most local and to go to what is most abstract. Because it's easy to lambast and critique abstractions. It's difficult and nitty and gritty to have to get involved in the actual art of advocacy itself. Okay, uh, let's try to make this a quick hit question, then we'll have one final one. Uh, so, this is actually a two-parter. Is there a book that has been especially formative for, for you in your, uh, in your political action or the way that you come to see faith in politics? And the second question, uh, talking about how the press uh, for, you know, emphasizes certain stories and social media, you know, highlights uh, drama and, and anger and, and, and fear and that kind of thing. Uh, where do you both get your information oh, about what's going on in politics and government in the U.S.? So book, where do you get your information? So book, I would say, uh, formatively, I would say the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, oh. uh, just to see how he dealt in a society where many of his people were still enslaved but yet he was able to keep his calm and create a cogent kind of defense, a constitutional defense of, of freedom. Um, I think that's very telling and do it from a Christian perspective uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and then who do, what do I listen to? You know, I've been listening, to, I like a lot of different podcasts. Um, I've been listening to The Rising, which is the, on the Hill, which mm -hmm. is a, a show on the Hill. They give a different perspective that's not going to go along with the right or the left. Not that I agree with all of it, but The Rising is a good uh, show uh, that you can get on YouTube. Okay. A couple of books. Um, I would recommend Jonathan Lehman's How the Na or Why the Nations Rage, or How the Nations Rage. Yeah. I forget which. Nations Rage. <laughs> Jonathan Lehman. Uh, another book would be David Van Drunen's Politics After Christendom. Hmm. It's a little bit more academic, 
but it's accessible and it's fantastic. So politics after Christendom. Uh, and by way of news, I mean, I'm just going to be very honest with you. I think cable news is the source of a lot of our national rot. So if I can make one recommendation, stop watching your news. Read your news. Read a diversity of viewpoints of the news. So I, I subscribe to Apple News. It's 10 bucks a month. That gets me The Atlantic. That gets me National Review. That gets me The Wall Street Journal. Uh, I check in on The New York Times. Uh, I read my news. I make, a, I make an intentional point not to watch my news. Uh, that's not because I'm trying to be an academic, intellectual elitist. Uh, it's simply because I think that um, news is being curated according to uh, algorithmic desires for what will sell ad revenue and not always what is most conducive to the common good. Okay. Although I think if you read the news, you do do it in a tweed jacket. I think that's important. Yes. Uh, for sure. Yes. Um, last question. So we're several weeks into the Biden administration. I'd like to hear from both of you. Uh, is the administration so far, has it been better than, worse than, or about what you expected from your particular perspectives? And then is there something in the administration, uh, again, maybe Justin being a Democrat, maybe something that you would say, oh, that's disappointing. Uh, and then Andrew, coming from a more conservative perspective, that's encouraging. It's about what I expected. Uh, I think they're doing a pretty good job when it comes to, to COVID. Um, they, it took a little longer, I think, to get the, the last uh, rescue plan passed than I, than I would expect it, but I think they're doing okay in that regard. The thing that just frustrates me because it's completely outside of their mandate is pushing this Equality Act, which was initially in the 100-day plan. That's not why the people put Biden in office, uh, and, and I think it's unfortunate that they would put any capital in the Senate or the House into that with everything else we have going on in uh, society. Hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I think, I think the Biden administration is about doing what I thought it would do, which I thought um, that I don't think Joe Biden is an ideologue, but I think when you look at the role of the presidency, uh, personnel matters just as much as uh, the person in the Oval Office. Hmm. And so I think he is staffing from the left um, much more than would have been thought we would have, would have thought had been the case based on how he campaigned. He was kind of campaigning as a little bit of a centrist or as at least as a uniter perhaps. But you know, with the um, appointment of Xavier Becerra at HHS, that's an unmitigated tra tragedy. I don't know of a better way to put that. Um, I will say he could have chosen a lot worse than Merrick Garland. Garland strikes me as a very reasonable candidate to have chosen uh, to have been chosen by a Democratic figure, so it could have been a lot worse, in my opinion. That's about right. Okay. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. It's been a busy day for both of you. Uh, they came in. Uh, they were on a flight early this morning. They're going on a late flight tonight. So uh, we're just very pleased to have you on campus. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. <laughs> to those online, make sure to check us out in faithandflourishing.org. We'll have an updated schedule of events as they come about. Thank you. Thank you.